Well, happy Wednesday, everyone. Welcome to Bowling with the FEF, a platform for you to share your unique bowling story all live on our YouTube channel. So happy to have you with us tonight on uh, what is going to be a great show. I can already uh, anticipate that. Um, if you are interested in sharing your bowling story with us, reach out to me. You can find me on Facebook. Um, you can DM me there. My name is Andrew Pfeffer. Or you can email the show at bowlingwiththefef at yahoo.com. We are uh, more than 50 episodes in and uh, with plenty more to go. And uh, we would love to hear your bowling story. Uh, again, if skill level kind of irrelevant. If you're passionate about the sport and have a unique story to tell uh, and are interested in coming on, please let me know. Uh, we'll get you on the schedule. And uh, I would love to share your bowling story uh, right here on the show. Uh, a great week this week uh, because of a, a couple different things. First of all, tomorrow, Veterans Day, I do want to uh, uh, put out a, a sincere thank you to uh, servicemen and women, uh, present and past. Uh, thank you for all you do uh, for our country. We don't say that enough, and uh, I want to take this opportunity uh, to just give you a, a hearty thank you um, and appreciation for everything that you do uh, to make sure that uh, our country is free, uh, that uh, knuckleheads like me can sit here without a worry in the world or care in the world and talk on a microphone and uh, really enjoy life. So thank you to all the veterans out there. Uh, the other thing is uh, I want to call your attention uh, to a YouTube channel called Bub Facts. Uh, that's put on by my son. Uh, his, he's nine years old. And uh, this weekend, he threw his first ever turkey. Uh, it was very exciting for him. Uh, three strikes in a row for the first time in junior leagues. Um, I, he was so excited. I was excited for him. I asked him, can I put the video on this show? He said, nope, you can refer them to my YouTube channel. So a very enterprising young man, my son Carson is. But uh, if you're interested in seeing his first turkey, uh, go ahead and find Bub Facts uh, right here on YouTube and uh, check out the video. It's on there right now. Uh, I, before I bring out my guest, I do want to remind you that Bowling with the Feff is brought to you by Chip Magnet Salsa. Uh, it is a family-owned business right down the street here in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. You can see uh, my sister-in-law there uh, enjoying some cilantro lime uh, with her breakfast burritos. It's great stuff. Um, it's distributed to 38 states and Canada, quality salsas, and uh, much, much more. Uh, it's great on breakfast burritos. It's great with just chips. Great on eggs, tacos, burritos, whatever you like. Um, you know, a few weeks ago, I actually uh, took some cilantro lime and I marinated this uh, Aberlon pad in it overnight and uh, wanted to see, you know, what kind of ball motion I could get. So I take the, you know, the, the Aberlon pad out of the fridge I get it going on the ball. Uh, the ball motion didn't really change, but now I have a nice red accent wall over in the other room there. So anyway, uh, if it's not in your neighborhood store, uh, go to chipmagnetsalsa.com because nothing else compares. Chip Magnet Salsa, raise your snack standards. So now, uh, let's get on uh, to our guest tonight. He is the one, the only, Parker Bone the Third. From New Jersey, uh, let me talk about some of the accomplishments. Uh, USBC Hall of Famer, PBA Hall of Famer. Uh, he has 35 national PBA Tour titles, a half dozen PBA 50 titles. Um, I, I want to save some of this for your story, but uh, it is an absolute pleasure to have you on the show, Parker. Well, thanks. I sincerely appreciate you having me and, and uh, just making bowling bigger and better every day. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we're trying to do here, and uh, we're off to a great start. Uh, certainly thanks to folks like you and the others who have been so kind and uh, willing to come on the show. So uh, let's start with this. Um, today on uh, on Facebook, I noticed uh, that the Bone and Zano Zone is coming back uh, in live format tonight at 7 o'clock my time, 8 o'clock yours. Uh, and that's your son, Justin. You've got to be uh, totally pumped about that. Absolutely elated. You know, he... Uh... He started to try to do this internet show uh, about two or two and a half years ago. It was a little bit more sporadic then. And uh, when I say that, uh, Mike Valenzano, who happens to be older, obviously, has a little bit more bowling knowledge, let's say, here locally. 
But between his local knowledge and between Justin traveling around and knowing all the players, it really made for a great show and a great time. Well, we all know the pandemic kind of shut down everybody and you really couldn't go anywhere. So it was really a new, unique situation that they could run their show. It turned into a weekly affair. Sometimes they, I believe that they had two shows in a given week and they really turned in, into something that was absolutely magnificent. And it, it, from my eyes, it kept bowling in the forefront in front of everybody else. Yeah. Um, you know, like I was telling you before we went live tonight, I am definitely a fan of that show. He does a great job both in live and in recorded uh, content on the sport of bowling. Again, that's the Bone and Zano show uh, zone, rather. Uh, 7 p.m. if you're here in Wisconsin or in the central time zone or uh, 8 p.m out east and uh i anticipate it'll be a great show as his shows usually are um he's out at wichita state now uh tell me what that's like i mean you've got to be a <laughs> you know really proud to have uh you know a son in one of the nation's top collegiate programs well he's kind of following in his mother's footsteps believe it or not <laughs> you know i i went to a local community college before eventually i went out on the pba tour but my wife leslie his mom uh, that's her alma mater. That's where she went to four years. She graduated with a degree in business out there at Wichita State. And she really, truly loved it every minute of it and has a lot of lifelong memories that certainly still to this day have a direct tie into a lot of things that we do out on the road or in the bowling world. Well, Justin, I, I say this nicely because he truly has been out there since he's been in the womb so to speak, <laughs> you know, so we've spent Halloween out there at Wichita because we were bowling right there at North Rock Lanes. We've been out there for some other tour stops through the years. The World Series of Bowling was out there as well. But more importantly, Wichita is a sincere bowling community. It's big around bowling for sure. And Wichita State with a couple of other colleges in the area there really know all about the great sport. Yeah, uh, we were fortunate enough to have uh, North Rock Lanes manager Brent Bowers on in one of our earlier episodes, and uh, he really gave us a sense uh, as far as the culture and how bowling really is interwoven into that city and really that state of Kansas. And it was uh, it was clear to see that that's a, a big bowling area and really important to the bigger picture in our sport. Yeah, they're great. They're fantastic for the sport of bowling. I wish that every city across the globe uh, at least here in America for starters, but I'd like to see every city across the globe do part of what they do in and around the Wichita area because our sport would, would be number one runaway leader over far and above everything else. Sure. Let's talk about, uh, I guess, the, the reason this all came to be, and that was our off-the-sheet challenges. You've uh, been challenged twice now, uh, <laughs> once by Nicole DePaul uh, in episode 38, and then Chuck Gardner also challenged you in episode 42. I want to play back uh, what he had to say when he challenged you back then. Parker is um, just a tremendous human being, um, one of the one of the finest people I've ever known in my life. And uh, um, I think having Parker on would be a really good thing. I thought it was interesting that he didn't really mention your bowling accomplishments in that, but rather uh, complimented you as one of the finest people he's ever known. Is that something you work at or is that who you naturally are? I think that's just me. Yeah. I try to treat everybody the same as I want to treat a total stranger. Uh, you know, when I walk up to people, it's not very hard for you or me to look at somebody else and, and say, just treat us the same as we want to be treated. And when you look at that, it's a two way street. So it doesn't matter what somebody's accomplished, how much money they have or, or how little they have. At the end of the day, if you're in our sport, you want to try to roll the ball down. You want to try to knock over 10 pins. Some of us or let me say, eventually you try to get better and better and do it more and more. Very few of us have been on that plateau that's at a level that, you know, people just dream about getting to, but we really try to do what we can to enjoy the sport and have fun. And, it's, yeah. you know, so when it comes to that, it's just, it's the way that I was brought up by my mom and dad. Yeah. Um, you know, do you ever feel like your personality has that impact on where the sport goes? Or do you think that, 
it's kind of one person at a time, one, you know, one good impression at a time that grows this sport. Well, I think it is one good impression at a time. You know, we all have our own different ways of going through life, let's say, you know, and, and probably the best example that I can give, and he's a dear friend of mine. Okay. I, I mean, this from my heart is Pete Weber. You know, I say it all the time when I go to do a hall of fame banquet or to do a, a clinic or something, and we have a Q and a, and it goes out there. And I look at these people and go, folks, Pete Weber is Pete Weber. The guy that you see on TV, the guy that you see on the lanes, he is a fierce competitor and he wants nothing more than to win. And he doesn't care whose toes or whose body he has to step on to get to that check and trophy at the end of the rainbow. But what you need to understand is Parker Bone won't act like Pete Weber. Pete Weber won't act like Parker Bone. But we still have the same, uh, let's say, well wishes at the end of any given event that we want to try to climb the mountain and get to the top. So, you know, Pete has a heart. He does. He's, he's watched my kids when I was out on tour early on when I'd make the finals and Pete wasn't out there in the finals for that given event, which didn't happen very often, let's face it. Okay. <laughs> but in the early nineties, he'd sit down on the floor and, and babysit or be with my, my two sons for two, three, four hours while I was out there competing on the lanes because he does have that heart that most people don't see off the lanes. Sure. Uh, this past July, uh, PBA Commissioner Tom Clark, who came on this show in episode 34, wished you a happy birthday on social media, on Twitter. Um, he said that, quote, his form is so perfect you can get better by simply watching him bowl, but it's Parker's unmatched role as a bowling ambassador that makes him so special. Uh, I guess, why is that part of, uh, of what you do and why the sport is so important to you? Uh, well, because I want to see everybody out there enjoy the sport for what the sport has to offer. You know, I, I just earlier today, I was down at the bowling center and I was watching a couple of, let's say the seniors get lessons. They were getting lessons by another gentleman that's down there. He, coincidentally, he happens to be a senior player as well. And my wife was giving another senior a lesson on the lane next to him. Now I coincidentally was actually practicing with my own two kids at that point. And when you watch what goes on there, they're all on different levels, but they're all trying to roll the ball out there and knock over pins. And the success level that you see when somebody accomplishes what they're trying to set out to do, really it puts a smile that's on their face. Yesterday, I gave a gentleman a lesson actually down at the bowling center. I was trying to help him out. He couldn't make a temp, and he said, I make about 30% of my temp. And I said, that's way too little. You throw the ball a little bit too good not to be able to make at least 70 or 80%. I worked with him for about an hour. We got done. Obviously, we talked about some other things. He said he pre-bowled for his league. He told me that he left eight temp pins in three games and made every single one of them. There you so. Go. He was ecstatic about it. So when you watch those things unfold, the little kid wants nothing more than to knock over a pin. And when they do, the smile that they get from ear to ear, oh, my God, that's overwhelming. That, to me, says everything. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I experienced that same thing with my son over the weekend. Just, you know, seeing him <laughs> make that accomplishment. Uh, it's his success is definitely my success. And it feels, yep. you know, so good. You can't describe it. I mean, you you said it well right there. Um, tell me about what we should know about Parker Bone, senior and junior, your father and grandfather. Were they yeah. bowlers? Well, they, they were bowlers. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, they enjoyed it. Uh, unfortunately, my grandfather passed away when I was 45. Currently, I am now 58, so he's passed away now 13 years. But he bowled at the local bowling center that I grew up in at home. But uh, the biggest thing about Parker Bone Sr., and uh, I have found this out through a number of years of being out on the road, is he was a race car driver. Oh. And he was well known on the racetrack here in New Jersey, but basically he was known from Maine down to Florida, as far west as probably Chicago area. That uh, for periodically, every couple of weeks, somebody would come up and say, hey, are you in any relation to Parker Bone Sr. or or Parker Bone, the race car driver? Yeah, it's it's my grandfather. <laughs> well, my dad, my dad was a bowler, but my dad never really got into the race car scene. And fortunately for me, 
he got married young in his life and he was a really good athlete in a lot of other sports, but he never took that sports uh, venue to that nth level. Okay. He basically had a family when he was 20. Uh, obviously I'm one of those. I have my younger sister and uh, he wanted to stay at home and take care of his kids. And that was more important to him than being out on the road. And then I came along, you know, yeah. so, uh, uh, you know, I didn't go the racing way. Maybe there's a lot to be said for that, for the fact that uh, why didn't you go that way? There's all millions of dollars to be made out there. But you know what? I'm doing something that I truly love to do each and every day. I meet somebody else in our great, wonderful sport. And not that there's not other fans in all these other great sports that are out there. But I truly love nothing more than rolling a ball down a lane. So I believe that the lane that I picked was the correct lane. <laughs> I'm not going to second guess you, that's for sure. <laughs> so tell me about how and when and where uh, you started bowling initially. Well, the first time I ever went bowling, it was actually my mom. Uh, my mom took me bowling when I was eight years old. And needless to say, I kept pulling her pant leg to take me back ever since. And, and that is a <laughs> God's honest truth, true story. I still bowl and practice today at the center that I grew up in. It's the place that everything started for me, Howell Lane's. It's not far from where I live. Uh, we're actually getting ready to put up a wall and we're going to build a, a, a five lane sector in there that we're going to have, uh, you know, some interest out on the lanes that we're going to put spark for entertainment purposes. It's uh, the latest and greatest format by Brunswick there to go out and, and watch on lane visuals and enjoy it. But we're also going to put specto and video analysis and we're going to make it a training facility here in the Northeast, you know, and it's not just going to be limited to me. Uh, you know, my job is out on the road. I work for Brunswick Corporation and I know and respect by all means what my job entails. But we're going to have a wide variety of coaches that are going to come in and be a part of it. But that's where everything started for me. And when I say that, it, it breaks my heart. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that actually had the opportunity to meet my mom. But we lost her to COVID back in uh, in March. So unfortunately, she's no longer with us. But I know uh, she can rest in peace because she knows that she's watching over me and all the bowlers each and every step. Yeah. When you talk about kind of your beginnings and starting to learn and grow in the sport, uh, was it your parents that were your coaches or did you have other coaches that really kind of set the foundation for you? No, it would have been my parents for starters. But, uh, you, you know, when, when I say they were my coaches, they were the access to get to the bowling center. Uh, you know, they, they brought me there. I don't want to say that they dropped me off and left because that's not necessarily the case. But we had the junior league coaches. And I can remember, uh, you know, the very first uh, junior league coach that we had, Hilda Negra. My God, she would yell at a bowler to do a certain thing on lane three and we would hear on lane 30. That's a God's honest truth. You know, follow through. Make sure you reach out. Don't cut it off. And it, it was funny, but it stuck with you. It, it resonated. And I believe that it helped a lot of kids in our league really understand how to get the ball out there in front of me and go accordingly. But just like most other kids, because I was no different and, and my children now are no different, although they are starting to pay attention. <laughs> you know, when your parents would tell you something, you didn't really think that they knew exactly what they were talking about, but you'd listen and maybe you've had half-heartedly listen. But then when I was 17, my mom acquired uh, well, let's just say a very great bowler in our sport. Some guy named Dave Davis and his wife, Joanne, owned a bowling center 30 minutes from me and asked them to actually take me under their wing and teach me the proper aspects. I see. Between those two points, when you started out when you were 17, um, did you have junior leagues, junior tournaments, things like that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we had a, our local junior tournament. You got your local association stuff, county and state. And then uh, we had Chuck Pisano Jr. started the JBTs then. Mm -hmm. So JBTs were every month. Uh, there might have been one month that maybe had two. He had a specialty event that went on there. But I can tell you right now, you really got to see where you fit in with a lot of other really, really good junior bowlers, not just from our county or from our state. But we were bringing bowlers in from New York. We were bringing good bowlers, or he was bringing good bowlers in from Connecticut. He might have brought one or two in from Massachusetts. Uh, there might have been a junior bowler that came in from Delaware, for all I know. Uh, you know, so 
it definitely opened your eyes up that, hey, you are not that big fish in a little pond. You're a very small fish in a big sea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when did you start JBTs? I started JBTs when I was 17. Okay. Uh, that's that's when I started bowling them. Uh, you know, success, maybe not immediately. I'm not going to say that by any means. But uh, I fortunately got a little better along the way. That was really when when Dave and his wife started to work with me and, and propel my game into making it better and better than it was. And then fortunately, I did win two JBT titles. And when I say two, there are many of kids out there that have won many more type JBTs than Parker Bone. But, you know, it was just, it slowly started to come along. And then I went out of junior bowling. I actually stayed juniors for one full year after I graduated high school. I just didn't run into adult bowling right away. And uh, it, it just turned into adult bowling. And then uh, I, well, politely, I never looked back. Yeah. Was there any kind of high school program? That you got into? We, we only had a local high school, uh, let's say, league for the high school itself. We were not part of what we call the Shore Conference or the high school association like they have it now. Now all of the high schools subsequently have teams out there and they have members. I mean, some of them have one or two teams. They have a varsity and a JV team. And then uh, a bunch of the high schools not only have a boys team, but then they have a girls team too. So there's a lot of things that have come up along the way. Unfortunately, we didn't have that. We had it as a club sport, and there were 96 bowlers from the school that went down there and played it as a club sport. We had 32 lanes going of three-man teams. And, uh, well, I remember in the wintertime when we did that sport, most of the time all of the teams and their members showed up. Wow, that's awesome. Um, so you mentioned Dave Davis, who many of us know because of his success, uh, you know, competing, but when he starts coaching you, what do you, what did he do that was, that made an impact on you? And what do you remember from the lessons he taught you? Well, the, the biggest thing was I was this little fiery run up to the foul line kid that was falling all over the place and, uh, definitely dropped my shoulder, was hunched over and, he said, all right, kid, if you're going to do some of these things, we got to teach you the right way first. The first thing we're going to teach you is you're going to learn how to not slunch over. So, and you know, when I say that slumping, my back would be really far forward like this. Shoulders were really rolled over. So for literally 30 days straight, I had to go home. My lesson was not on the lanes. My lesson was off the lanes, put my shoulders and my hips to the door frame and stand there and hold it for 10 minutes. Oh my God, did my lower back kill me when I got done with 10 minutes, <laughs> but it didn't take long after 30 days. I learned how to stand straight, you know? Mm -hmm. So then we learned how to get some knee bend, which I had plenty of knee bend anyway, but he wanted me to go to the foul line and bluntly finish it, stick it, understand where you hold that position as you get the ball off of your hand so you can truly watch it go through your target and all the way down the lane towards the pins. And that was probably one of the hardest things for me to do in the beginning because I kept running up to the foul line. I was a track, you know, athletic wise. I did a lot of different sports. None of them really propelled. I loved baseball. I loved uh, track and doing a, a lot of the different things in sports there. I ran high hurdles and regular hurdles. By no means am I going to put my hand up and say, yeah, I was one of the top three on the team because that wasn't the case. But bowling was my gig and I understood that. And it was just a matter of putting all those pieces of the puzzle together. And one by one, they really started to come into play. Yeah. What I'm visualizing here is almost like a karate kid type deal where you, <laughs> don't, you don't really know what painting the fence is going to do for you in the karate tournament. I mean, when he started having you, you know, do those drills to stand up straight off the lanes on the door frame, did you think to yourself, am I ever going to use this in bowling? I never thought that. Okay. Trust me when I say that. I mean, I'm sitting here doing that and I can remember bluntly collapsing a couple times and laying on the floor because my lower back was so stiff and so sore. But I just believed it. I thought to myself, there's a reason that this gentleman, because that's I respected him, okay? 
But there's a reason that this professional bowler, this gentleman, this guy that has accomplished so much on the lanes, what he's trying to teach me now to make me a better player. Yeah. And uh, it, it formulated my game. At least I believe that it formulated my game into what I have become today. No question about it. Wow. Yeah. And that shows a lot, uh, you know, when you talk about people who get into this and really succeed, you know, I remember Clark saying when he was on, they have the focus, they have the drive, they put in more effort, they work harder. Uh, That's also been said about Shannon O'Keefe. Do you feel like at that young age, you had some of those those things, those traits, those the focus, the the effort that maybe your peers either, uh, you know, maybe had some of or didn't have quite as much? Well, I, I look at a couple of my friends back at home and, uh, you, you know, I grew up with some kids like we all, most of us do. We're down at the bowling center practicing mm-hmm. and a couple of my friends would go down there and bowl three, maybe four games. And the next thing you know, they're in the back. Pac-Man became a big game then. Space Invaders was another big game then. Okay. (laughs) They learned how to play those games pretty good. They learned how to really master a pinball machine really, really well. And I'd be out on the lanes for two or three hours, you know? So I was putting the extra time and effort in because I wanted to get better. It was in my heart to get to be a better bowler. Did I know then that I'd accomplish what I've, you know, been very fortunate through the last 35 years? No, I had no idea, but I kept working striving to become better and my friends they were happy being the best pac-man player or the best space invaders guy you know in in the game at that point and uh you know i enjoyed it that was fun but my time was out on the lanes sure so uh, what about the pba what told you that you were ready to get into the pba and did you go out on tour right away or did you start with regional events i started with regional events Uh, You know, and I'm going to role play it back just a little bit. Uh, I was very lucky in life. Let's say it that way. And I hope that my life isn't over as we speak here. I want (laughs) to continue onward. But uh, growing up where I grew up, uh, it started with Dave Davis and his wife, Joanne, because I give her a lot of credit for formulating my game into two. But transcending into that, there was another guy that we all know through the bowling world that only lived about 20 minutes from Dave Davis Lane's who started to become part of my career as well, indirectly, some guy named Mark Roth. (laughs) Okay. By the way, you can't go wrong with having those two guys in your, in your back pocket. No, not at all. (laughs) So Roth came down to the bowling center one day and, and I knew he was coming. He was coming to the place that I grew up in. And I'm thinking, Oh my, we're going to bowl. We're, we're really going to hit the lanes. And he's watching me bowl and he's explaining something to be about spares and he goes, you know, when you go straight at your spares, you're going to you're going to really learn how to make a lot more spares. And, and I'm like, you know, why is he saying I think I'm a pretty good spare shooter, but maybe I wasn't at that level. And when a guy like Mark Roth is telling you that it, you got to be stupid not to open your ears up and really listen as to what he's saying to you. But uh, we went out there to bowl and I went out there for 10 or 15 minutes. He goes, throw me a double. I throw him a double and he'd go out there with a spray gun and he, you know, two pumps or three pumps and cross white monolanes. He go throw me another double, and the first shot would always miss the head pin. Hmm. And I'm like, okay, we did this for an hour and a half. He never threw one shot. <laughs> after I threw the last double, after he did this a couple of times, he walks out. He goes, okay, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. And I'm like, I can't believe he did that to me. <laughs> me? I thought we were bowling a game. But in that hour and a half, what he taught me was so valuable open my eyes up to what's going on with the lanes, that things can happen, things can change. And although it doesn't sound like much, two or three pumps or one run, as we know it with a machine today, and you can go from looking like a king to looking like a chump. Okay. I don't want to be that chump. (laughs) I want to figure out how to get somewhere in the middle and work my way back up to that king status. And uh, then I started bowling regionals. And then this other guy, that actually lived 30 minutes from us as well. I call him, uh, you know, the happy trio here. Uh, Some other guy that's got a very well named in our sport, guy named Johnny Petraglia. Ah, okay. He kind of took me under his wing when I first went out on tour. Johnny lived locally, and he taught me about little things to look for, nuances, things to watch on the lanes when you're bowling out there that you can see this or you see that, you see this, play this. 
And the next thing I knew between the three of them, how can I go wrong? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Wow. Um, so you start on regionals and with obviously this great, you know, wealth of knowledge from professional bowlers, what, you know, what did it tell you right away when you started regionals and how did you kind of progress and have the confidence to make that leap to the national tour? Well, I was, I was seeing success along the way, you know, it, it didn't happen instantly overnight. Please understand that. Uh, my game was progressively getting better. I was bowling scratch tournaments, uh, not just at home, but, you know, open up that mushroom, so to speak, and branch out two, three hours away. And I'd find myself amongst the top five or the top 10 in three out of five, four out of five tournaments. And I'm like, wow, uh, you know, I'm doing pretty good here. So let's try to up another level. And the next level is to bowl the PBA regionals. And we had a lot of good regional players in our region. Actually, our region was probably by far the strongest region on the left out of any region across the country. I mean, we had at least 10 or 15 really, really great players. You had Petraglia, you had Davis, you had Tony Teresa who had 15 titles. You had Dwayne Fisher, you had Peter Hakem, you had Bruce Holland, who's a, a national tour titleist. Obviously you had myself and, and then you had Andy Nyer, you had Steve Hardy. I mean, there were a lot of really good players that came out of the East region on the left side. Well, when you're bowling against that many guys and then you find yourself finishing in that top two, three, four, a couple of times you go, I think that maybe we need to take, try to take this even to another level and go out on tour. Yeah. And, uh, you know, fortunately for me, I had a really good sponsor because the tour didn't start out as great as people think it would. You know, they look at me and they go, Oh my God, you know, you must've been a star standout. Well, how about Fef? If I'm going to tell you, my first 10 tournaments I went out on tour, I did not cash. Wow. And then I finally got a check and I went 10 more tournaments without getting a check. So wow. I was one for 21. And when I look back at that now, I go, oh my God, that was terrible. But yeah. I felt like I kept digging into the trenches. I was the guy that was at the bowling center practicing late at night after the tournament was done. I want to get out there and try to figure out what I can do. Sometimes I'd be able to get in the bowling center at five in the morning and go practice. Even though I didn't qualify for the event, they would let me come in. Whoever was oil in the lanes would actually open a door and I could go down on one and two and practice just because I wanted to figure out how I was going to get better and sitting on a chair, just not paying attention, channel surfing in your room or drinking another beer. Wasn't going to do it. Yeah. Wow. So it takes you a few years now before we, and I say we because I'm sitting here in Wisconsin, we see you on TV. We see you on TV in 1987. Um, tell me about this first, this tournament where you make the show. Um, it was, uh, I, I want to say, gosh. Peoria, have, Illinois. There you go. Landmark Peoria, Lanes in Peoria, Peoria Illinois. Open. Yeah. I remember it vividly. So, so what um, went right, you know, in the, in the, you know, the rounds leading up to the telecast? Well, uh, when I got done bowling, let's say Wednesday, Wednesday, I find myself on top of the leaderboard and I'm like, oh my God, I'm actually leading a PBA tournament. And it were only 12 games of competition, but I mean, let's face it. I look to my left and I got Mike Albee and I got Steve Cook and Earl Anthony still bowling down there. You know, and Roth is on the other squad along with Johnny Petragli, and I'm going, oh, my God, I'm actually leaving this tournament. Yeah. So I make the finals, and I bowl okay the first night. It wasn't too bad. Actually, no, the first night I was still leading the tournament. Well, now, forget it. Now I can't sleep. You know, I'm up all night Thursday night. I mean, I'm, like, checking my watch to make sure I don't oversleep, and it just – it's going, you know, around the clock. Well, I bowl, obviously, good enough to maintain staying in second. But when I say that, you know, the show is now Saturday and Saturday is going to be a live telecast. Yep. Well, I know I, I never bowled on TV before, but I'm going to go under the assumption that they're going to tell me when it's time to bowl. And, and if I do everything else I need to do, then we can go from there. Well, my mm -hmm. first game on national TV is against Pete McCordick. <laughs> first shot, I leave a seven pin. And that was probably the best thing that could have happened to me. Yeah. Because when I leave a seven pin, 
I obviously move to the other side of the approach, but I throw the ball hard and straight. Mm -hmm. And when I did at that moment, it actually helped loosen the rest of me up and let everything go down. And then I was out there to actually bowl and I didn't have to worry about anything else. I mean, you know, the cameras guys right there, the lights are in front of you, you're hot, you're sweating, you know, the heat of the moment. And then they say, okay, hold up because we got commercial, which I knew nothing about at that point. You know, <laughs> I'm ready to keep going here. And, uh, my score of 245, my first game on national TV, was good enough for a tie. Now you got a ninth and tenth frame roll off. So fortunately, I, I win the tie. I beat Pete McCordick, and then I go on to bowl John Gant for the title. Uh, you know, and John, we've become great friends too through the years. John beats me for the title. And a reporter asked me at that point when we went back to the press room, he goes, you know, your first TV show, you finished second. Are you upset? I said, are you kidding? Upset? <laughs> I'm a firm believer. If I get there once in my life, I'll get there again. Yeah. So to me, I broke the bubble at that point. Three yeah. months later, I led a PBA tournament out on national tour in Seattle, Washington. And I fortunately, I walked away with my first title against Scott Devers in the Columbia 300 Open in Seattle, Washington in 1987. Yeah. And you guys were were friends at the time, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah, we were friends because we were both still bowling PTQs. You know, <laughs> we're bowling those each week and we're out there. Now, the next thing we know, we're both bowling for the title. And uh, once again, it's it's one of those surreal moments that I remember vividly. And, and I would hope Scott could say this, but uh, we were dead tied to the pin after five frames mm -hmm. and they broke for commercial. And I put my hand out and I shook his hand. I said, Scott, I said, great bowling this week. If you win, congratulations. Good luck at the Firestone Tournament and Champions. Unfortunately, if you lose, you know what? Go get them next week, and hopefully next week will be your title. I ended up winning the title. So for me, it was my first title. Scott won his first title two weeks later down in Tucson, Washington, or Tucson, Arizona. There you go. Wow. So it's just, it's funny the way things happen sometimes. What Was he surprised when you did that during the commercial break? Uh, maybe he was. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, we were good friends and we were still good friends even afterwards. Yeah. You know, it was just it's part of the, the nature of the beast. We all want to win. And we know that the way that the sport is derived, just like most other sports, there's only going to be one champion crowned when it's all said and done. Yeah. And uh, that's the way that it, it fell out. So it was it was really a cool time. Sure. And from there, you start winning. You every year or two, you'd you'd win. You know, one, two, sometimes more. How did you keep getting those wins? Was it, you know, the kind of the relief of having made those shows in '87, and you knew what the program was, and you kind of got to relax and be in your element a little more, or was it something else? Well, I, you know, I tried to put, uh, let's say, give yourself something new to push for. My dream when I first went out on tour theft, honestly, and I say it to this day, my dream was to hopefully say I am a PBA champion before I quit the tour. I wanted to win one time. I can say that in front of you now. I've amassed 35 titles and a bunch of other accolades. Okay. Yeah. But after I won my first title, now my new goal was to not only win another title, but to figure out how to make $100,000 in a given year. And in 1989, I actually eclipsed that for the first time in my career. Wow. So then my goal was to figure out not just to win now. My goal is to get to $100,000 every year. But now my goal is to try to figure out how to become PBA player of the year. That was a little bit extra work. Okay? <laughs> that ladder was a lot of steps to climb. Because yeah. you don't just uh, get that one in one event so to speak. So uh, fortunately, before the decade would end in the 1990s, uh, in 1999 there, I did capture PBA Player of the Year. And every year in the 1990s, I was able to amass 100000 in, in earnings. And, you know, if you go back and look at our prize funds and look at the money that we were bowling for at that time, that was no easy task. No, so you not at you all. You work in front of you. Yeah. I want to talk about uh, the the fifth title you won, the 1990 ABC Fall Classic. You know, that one's in Milwaukee, my hometown, mm -hmm. at Red yep. Carpet Celebrity, not there anymore. Um, so you're on TV, and Earl Anthony says, he's calling the game, he says that you could very well be the best left-hander on the tour at this point. Um, 
do you feel at this point like one of the best, if not the best, on tour? How do you take that away from some guy named Mike Albee? <laughs> I mean, Mike Albee, the year before, you know, or whatever year it was there, I don't know, 80, 88 or 89, uh, earned $200,000 on a tour, was PBA Player of the Year. He was the first guy to earn that much money. And uh, look at what he had accomplished up to that point. Now, I may have had a good stretch going on there. Don't get me wrong, because in 1990, uh, I had won twice already, and now I'm bowling for my third title. So, you know, there were some good things happening for Parker Bone, but I can't take that away from Mike Albee. And, and, you know, Earl only bowled one or two events. I think back then he might have bowled one, just a specialty event, or maybe a proprietor asked him because Earl Anthony was going to draw. There's no question there that Earl Anthony was going to bring people to the table. So, uh, you know, and, and you've still got the likes of, Steve Cook out there. You, you know, you still had John Gant out there. There were other players. Hugh Miller was still out there, and Hugh Miller won five or six times up to that point. So there were some other left-handers that were still bowling. So that might have been a big set of shoes for him to actually try to put on my feet. But, <laughs> uh, you know, humbling as it would have been at that point, I still wanted to go out and do do my job and do it the best way that I could. Sure. Um I think this is a good point to get into uh, what Jeff Riggles told me about what makes you successful. Um, that's the question I asked him. He said, it's a flawless physical game that you repeat and a mental game that has dealt with the feast or famine nature of being a lefty for decades. Both are necessary to achieve what you have achieved. He says it's very interesting stuff, but he would imagine exploring the struggle of dealing with the knowledge that many weeks you will have little chance and the pressure of needing to take advantage of those when you have the advantage and dealing with the sad reality that whatever you do will always be in the context of being left-handed. Is that kind of a, a thing that kind of, I guess, I don't know, eats at you a little bit that knuckleheads like me are going to throw the, you know, where do you rate in terms of lefties around? Or should it just be, we're all bowlers. It doesn't matter if we're bowling right-handed, left-handed, two-handed, whatever. It's it's unfortunate, but it's what's brought our sport to where we are today. You know, uh, there are a lot of people that have been fortunate to win a title or more out on tour or win a title or more locally on a regional tour or a scratch event. I don't care what the name tag is behind that event. If you've won it, I'm going to tell you right now, I'll be glad to walk up and shake your hand and say congratulations because you amassed and went over top of everybody else. But unfortunately, a lot of times out on the PBA tour or even locally, because I've watched it happen many a times, You'd go, you'd go out there and bowl good, and it'd be like, well, they gave it to you. What do you mean they gave it? Well, they gave it to you, you know, because you got a chance to play. Oh, really? You know, and then you bowl bad or you struggle. Well, it's unfortunate they didn't give you a chance this week. Well, you know what? Maybe, but I'm still rolling the ball, and I'm going to try to figure out what's going on out there. And and then you'd win a title, and they'd be, yeah, that's nice that they gave you a look, you know. And I'm like, so. Not to mention his name, okay, but I'm going to tell you this because it's a true story with a very, very well-known player out on the PBA tour, okay, one of the tour superstars. I had a conversation with him, and I said, and by the way, this gentleman is right-handed. I said, I had a conversation with him, and I said, I'll bet you that every title you've ever won, you feel like you've earned. He goes, absolutely. And I said, I believe that same way for me. But I will bet you if you ask the bowling world, half of the titles that I've won, I've earned. And the other half, they probably look at me or I know because I've heard it myself. It's nice that they gave you something this week. And he looked at me and puzzled. And then he looks at me again. He goes, you know, I've never thought about that, but I'll bet you're absolutely right. It's a true story. It's just part of the nature of the beast. You know, we as the bowlers don't oil the lanes. We participate on them. 
we roll our ball down and try to overcome the circumstances that are out there in front of us. We know sometimes the lanes are going to break down favorably. We know sometimes the lanes are going to break down unfavorably. And sometimes we get caught up in the moment of not visually seeing what's going on, what's unfolding around us. This one got lucky. That one got unlucky. This one got the bad break. You know what? Feff, I'm telling you right now, it all evens out at the end. Yeah. If you keep this focused on what you need to do, keep in your own game. I watched that by watching Mike Albee for a number of years out on tour when I first went out there. The man could be struggling. He could be 50 under, 100 under, whatever the case may be, two or three weeks in a row. And the next week you'd look and he'd be 300 pins ahead of second place going into Friday night <laughs> because he always kept a positive mental outlook. And Jeff kind of did hit it on the head with saying, being left-handed, you have to be willing to take the punches when the punches are there. But the minute you see something, taste victory. Don't just taste the check. So yeah. in answer to your question, sum it up the best. You have to keep your game ready to go at all times because you don't know when that flip switches just a little bit. All of a sudden, you want to be the guy that's ready to ring the dinner bell. Sure. Sure. Tell me about this time when it was tough for a guy named Bob Learn Jr. to keep that focus, shooting a 10-pin against you in the 1996 <laughs> flagship Open. Well, you, you know, that was only the second time that we ever bowled an arena-type setting. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of new things that we're all going to have to deal with, and we don't know exactly how they're all going to unfold or, or turn out. But... Bob got up in the second frame. He shot at a 10 pin. And when he's bluntly in the third step of his approach, I had a perfect line of sight there that a, a lady in the third or fourth seat right in front of the foul line there. So she was probably no more than the dots stands up in the middle of her in middle of his approach because she had to go get something, and, you know, and what she had to get. I don't know. It's not for me to understand or, or you know, get to the bottom of. But it was really unfortunate the way it happened. Well, Bob flat out pulled up on the approach. And, and Bob's a good friend of mine. So I'm going to say he might pull up on the approach a bunch of times when he shoots his spare. But at that given moment, there's no doubt that the flinch that he acquired uh, was because of it. It's the second frame of the tournament. All right. However things are going to unfold, there's still eight frames or ten frames to play of our game. Let's see how it goes. Yes, I would give him the shot over. Yes, he would make the spare. I would lose 280 to 279. He still had to go out and earn it. Yeah. Wow. I would do the same call again if I had to that I did then. And, and I know I'm the one that lost at that moment in time, but it was totally the right thing to do for the circumstances at hand. Yeah. Pretty unique situation, wouldn't you say? I mean, that hasn't happened since, has it? Not to the best of my knowledge, but we all know now there's many, many elements that go into play. I mean, you know, you look at the king of the lanes, for God's sakes, or you look at the stuff that happens when we're bowling up in Portland, Maine. I mean, that is one energetic crowd. My God, they're into it and they're moving and they're doing their thing and everything else. So if you don't know when you go there to focus on your target, shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I you know, I want to call it back to uh, one of Justin's videos. He illustrated that really well from his perspective of uh, this past uh, year's King of the Lanes. He uh, has a video up on YouTube that I thought was excellent. Um, 1998 ABC Masters. You shoot 300 on TV, which had only been done about a dozen times before. And, and it was interesting, I thought, that it was during a three-person match. Uh, tell me what it was like for you to kind of go through that. Well, I, I mean, you know, I was bowling uh, Chris Sand. For starters, and I, I'm drawing an epiphany here. I, I know Mike is his first name. He lives up in the southern tier of New York. And, and uh, Mike, uh, I'm, I'm apologizing to you. But uh, <laughs> it, there were three of us had their bowling. And Chris could still get up in the 10th and strike out for 258. So even though I had the front eight, I still had to perform in the ninth. And although when I got the one in the ninth, now I know the game is locked up. But now I have an op opportunity to do something that well let's face it most people in our sport don't get that chance yeah. okay they want to see somebody bowl 300 and we are entertainers when we're on tv you don't want to just watch a guy throw a shot 
and sit down. So get excited, get into it and, and seize the moment, if you want to say. Well, the year before, I did bowl 299 on TV at the showboat. Once again, a reporter asked me, are you upset? I said, eh, upset, yes, but I feel hurt for the fans, not so much for my, myself. But I told them the same thing, firm believer. I did it once in my life. I'll get there again. I just didn't know it that the following year I'd have the front 9, 10, 11, and then get them all to fall over for 300. That was pretty exciting for sure. Yeah, I bet. Um, so a- a- around this time, other stuff is happening, uh, you know, uh, uh, bowling related, but kind of apart from competition. Uh, you had a little appearance in the movie Kingpin. How did that happen? <laughs> that was a. Uh... That was the the wonderful, glorious company that I work for, Brunswick. Uh, Brunswick had some sort of, let's say, deal with the, the directors of the movie or somebody that was orchestrating and putting things together. And they wanted to bring some of the professionals out there. And fortunately for me, uh, being on their staff, I was asked to go out there and be a part of it. Uh, although I only had the cameo appearance, <laughs> I will say this, that it was rather enjoyable being out there with Woody Harrelson and shaking hands, you know, and talking to Bill Murray and being part of that whole ensemble there, but it really opens your eyes up to what they do in the movie industry, how you have to be here at seven o'clock, but you rush to wait because you got to wait until they're ready for your time and place out on the lanes. But it was Uh awesome. It really was awesome. They were, they were great guys. Yeah, for sure. Um, So then there's the lumber liquidators commercial where you're looking like you're about to throw a a bowling ball on the hardwood floor in your home when Leslie appears saying, Parker, don't even think about it. Uh, Was was that really your house? (laughs) Uh, Yes, that was our house. Uh, You know, most people don't understand that, that we fortunately did shoot all of that in our home. And uh, it was it was really amazing the way that all of that kind of come together. Uh, and you just missed my wife just walked outside our back door. I would have had her come over here for a minute, <laughs> but, uh, she gets the script or we get the script Sunday night, the night before. And, uh, she goes, you know, I'm looking at this script and you're not saying a word. I go, well, we're not writing the script. We're just <laughs> we're the actors. And she goes, but you don't say anything. I said, what can I tell you? I'm just long for the ride in the show here, but it truly was in our house. And, uh, it, you know, the guy that cuts in front of me that mm-hmm. says, sorry, we're out of time. Believe it or not, he was only about five foot one and he was standing on a milk carton so that they could put him <laughs> tall enough so that when he got in front of me and said, sorry, we're out of time. So, but that mm-hmm. ongoing thing, Parker, don't even think <laughs> about it. I still <laughs> hear that to this day, Fef. I'm <laughs> telling you, I do. Oh wow! If you haven't seen that, it's on YouTube, and uh, it's it's pretty entertaining. I thought I remember seeing it on TV and laughing a little bit. Um, how about the the process of creating the book, Bowling: How to Master the Game? That was really uh, I got to put a lot of compliments into Dan Erbs. Uh, you know, this came across the table to me to write an instructional book, and Dan knew a lot about writing there. And he said to me, he goes, Parker, he goes, you know, I think that if we do this book, let's try to do something really unique. There's not a color instructional book out there. And let me try to reach out to a company and see if we can't make that happen. And sure enough, he did. He reached out to Universal and he was able to put all of the, the, let's say, cross the T's and, and put the dots where they needed to. And Universal Books got on top of it. And we sat there for an endless amount of hours you know we we would sit there for an hour discussing a chapter and then he would write it and send it to me and i'm a guy that you got to understand it when i read i read every single word there's nothing fast about parker bone when he's reading so i read every word and i'd call him back with the changes that i felt needed to be changed and i'd be and by the way of is o of of not af (laughs) <laughs> you know, something simple like that. He go, Parker, don't worry. They got proofreaders that, that go through that. Well, there were still some things that weren't quite right in the book. So please don't waste your time looking through the book for the proofreading folks. Okay. <laughs> but he took the book to a whole nother level. And when the book got done, it really is, it, it come out to be better than I could have ever thought. 
and I got to give him all the credit. Unfortunately, he passed away about two years after the book. He had a battle with cancer going on, and I didn't even know that at that time. But mm -hmm. uh, it it was it was really a wonderful time that we did or had that shared writing it all. Um, I can't say enough about it. And I know that that book still helps people today. The only thing we don't have is a two-handed revolution because the two-handed bowler really wasn't in the foreplay at that point when we wrote the book. But uh, it a lot of the formulations are still the same. Yeah. There was also the bowling ball, the Parker Bone the Third MVP. You talk about not a lot of guys having the opportunity to shoot 300 on TV, which is true. Not a lot of guys have their name on a bowling ball, a high performance ball at that. Yeah, no, that was something special that Brunswick came uh, about once again. They came to Mike Albee, myself, and Walter Ray Williams and asked us if we wanted to be part of this MVP series that they wanted to come out with with Brunswick. And, uh, you know, just like, let's face it, Johnny Petraglia, who who hasn't seen or heard of the LT48? If you haven't in your lifetime, you sincerely have been living under a rock. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, I, I can't say that I wouldn't love the fact that my ball could get close to what Johnny Petraglia's was. But Johnny's ball was emblematic of a man of what he accomplished out on tour and kept going with the tour. You know, to this day, he still bowls PBA senior regionals and a couple senior uh, national events. He's 74 years old, for God's sakes. And he's still a competitor. Let me tell you, <laughs> it's in his heart. That man wants to win. So uh, we came out with this and they asked the three of us to come out with a ball that you felt would you like for your game that we could replicate and put, you know, in, uh, in under your name. And they might've tweaked it to some way, shape or form because Brunswick doesn't want anything to be exactly what it was before. They know that the evolution of the game, the way that lanes changed, the way the surfaces have changed and oils have changed that you need to stay up with the times. So my ball was emblematic of the speed zone. I thought yeah. the speed zone was a really great all round ball and uh, I will say this, uh, Fef, I'm going to tap myself on the shoulder. Mine was the first one to sell out. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. Um, and around this time, you have the ultimate accomplishment on the PBA Tour, and that is getting into the, P uh, the PBA Hall of Fame. So uh, what about getting that call and, and being inducted? What happened there? That was uh, exciting times. No question about it. You know, it, this little kid from central New Jersey has a dream of maybe going out on the PBA tour. And, and my dream, like I told you earlier, winning a title before I quit, who would have ever thought that I would accomplish the things that I had up to that point, uh, being PBA player of the year, I'm going to say that I had somewhere in the neighborhood of about 20 or 25 titles. Uh, and, uh, everything was just going long. Uh, really, really well. And then all of a sudden I get this phone call that says, I'm going to be inducted into the PBA Hall of Fame. I'm like, oh my goodness, unbelievable. <laughs> Would not have ever thought about that when I first, it, it wasn't even in my head to think <laughs> about being in the PBA Hall of Fame when I went out on tour. Yeah. Uh, was, I, I mean, was it all that you expected? The The induction, I'm assuming you had to have a speech, something like that? Oh, you had to have a speech. That's for sure. Uh, you know, and, and uh, you have all your peers out there that you're talking in front of. And, and that's a tough one to swallow. I mean, I know that some of them are close friends. Uh, you know, some of them might be rivals, uh, but some of them are, are people who may look up to you at that moment. Let's face it. If you're getting inducted into the Hall of Fame for bowling purposes, there's a lot of people out there in a the crowd that are newbies that are looking up to you standing up on that podium. They want to be in your shoes at some point in their career. And, uh, you, you know, you treat them all the same and give them all the same respect. At least that's the way that I was brought up, like we talked about earlier here. But to get up there and make that speech in front of everybody and, and uh, you know, Dave Davis was in the crowd. He actually introduced me that night into the PBA Hall of Fame. Uh, Johnny Petragli was there. Mark Roth was there. The three guys that I feel I give the most credit for allowing me to be where I was in the position I was in. And now they're all sitting there, you know, watching me get inducted into the Hall of Fame. And, and I I hope that there's a part of me that uh, I think that they were standing up on stage with me that night. Yeah. So 
you know, you're a Hall of Famer now, but you still have plenty in the tank. You're still a touring pro. You, you know, you go out, you bowl in the event that's named after after you, and you win it. Yeah. That, who does that? <laughs> who, who would have ever seen that one coming? <laughs> you know, that was in Albany, New York. Uh, the proprietor of the bowling center asked me about putting my name on the on the event, and I said, well, "Why my name?" She goes, "Parker." First of all, a lot of people look up to you in our area. I've always supported her regional. She had a very big regional. She had, coincidentally, the uh, weekend before Christmas every year. And it was one of the largest ones in the Northeast. And uh, she said a lot of local bowlers look up to you. Obviously, you've had success out on tour. uh, But I would like to know if it's okay to put your name on the tournament. And so we talked about it. And sure, lo and behold, it was. Well, what people don't realize at that point, you know, they right away they pencil you in because, well, your name's on a tournament. You're supposed to have an opportunity to win the one with your name on it. <laughs> I remember doing live TV shows at 630 in the morning, two or three mornings in the row, especially when I'm bowling good. OK, which turned into Thursday morning, Friday morning, Saturday morning, uh, doing live TV shows, 637 a.m., as well as. The new, the sports casting that night at eleven twenty five from the bowling center. So you go out, you go to bed, you get right back up, and you're right back in the thick of things the next day. I didn't know that the week was going to unfold like that, but lo and behold, before you knew it, here I am standing tall, collecting the check and trophy, and it was it was surreal. It really yeah. was. Yeah. Tell me about what you were thinking in the ninth when you're sitting on the bench watching Chris Barnes put it in the ditch. I'm going to tell you right now, I hope like Kelly doesn't do that when we go overseas next week. (laughs) (laughs) He's going to be my teammate. (laughs) I was was shocked. I really was shell-shocked at that point because I'm sitting there and I'm watching him and and he goes to get up in the ninth and and, and he's on a spare and I I look up, I go, oh my God, did that, did he? And I looked again, I go, he did. He just threw in the gutter. And then I believe he got nine. I don't even think he made the spare at that point. But whatever happened, it immediately took the whole game and it flip-flopped it right around. You know, where if there was any sense of pressure or any tension at that point, uh, that wasn't the case. Now I just need to go up there and just make a good shot. And whatever happens, happens. You know, fill a frame and and do whatever. But enjoy the victory lap. And in our sport – there's not a whole lot of times, you know, maybe 25% of the time that the guy enjoys a victory lap getting up in the 10th frame. Uh, most of the time, somebody's got to perform. Yep. And uh, at, at that moment, I I had a, a victory lap, and that was cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I saw a Facebook post on this event, uh, the, the event uh, of this show, uh, from Pat Humphrey, who is from Minnesota. He is uh, one of my best friends. We met through bowling. He's a lefty, um, always was much better than I was, uh, but just a, a tremendous talent when he was in the sport. Um, he said that he met you once uh, when he bowled his first USBC Masters in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which he said would have been 18 to 20 years ago. Um, he said he talked to you. He said he mentioned some things that he was advised of going into the tournament. And what he appreciates the most about you was that you essentially said, I think your coach gave you bad advice and that you were right. <laughs> and that he appreciated the willingness to say you know, for you to say it as it was exactly what he needed to hear, even though it wasn't necessarily what he wanted to hear. Is that hard for you to do? I mean, you know, say what really needs to be said in a situation like that, or is that just something that kind of comes out of you? I just, I want it right from my heart. Okay. I know that Everybody that coaches an individual bowler or every ball driller that goes out there to do what they think is right, they're doing what's right in their heart. But when I've been out on tour, at least at that point, as long as I had, the things that I had seen, most of the ball drillers, most of the coaches at home learn from the best. And the best at that moment in time, and even today, are still out on the men's and ladies tour respectfully. It doesn't matter to me which tour you're talking about because the people who are at the top 
see the lane and repeat it better than everybody else. So whatever it is that we may have been talking about or that whatever that point was, I looked at him and go, you know, your coach is probably trying to help you, but they're not feeding you the right information. And this is why I'm always going to give you a reason why. And when I say a reason or I'll back it up and go, this is a prime example. Look, the numbers speak for themselves. When you look at these guys, what they've accomplished, and you look at where you're at, what you're trying to miss here, I don't expect you to fit in Mark Roth's shoes or Marshall Holman's shoes, uh, you know, next week. But there's a reason that they've accomplished what they have. And this is the way that I see them going about it. Sure. Um, I- I'm assuming you don't remember that. Um, I don't remember that, but it, it, I'm telling you right now, that's happened a lot of times. Sure. Do you remember uh, in 2003? Uh, the first time that I interviewed you? Uh, no, I can't say that one either. <laughs> Don't hold that against me now. No, no, I won't. September 7th, 2003. It's in Marshfield, Wisconsin at Rose Bowl Lanes. You're there to do an exhibition. You shot 258 with a couple of ringing seven pins. Um, I stumbled to like a 190 something. Then you put me in a chair on the lane three quarters of the way down. You go back to the approach, grab the ball, roll it, goes right through the legs and strikes. Fortunately, you were still sitting in the chair. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure if I wanted to be there, but you, you told me it was going to be fine. Yeah, yeah. I told you that. I, I, I'm going to tell you right now, I've had a lot of success doing that. There was one or two times that I did hit the chair. I will tell you <laughs> now that it's over with. Okay. And one of them was actually, uh, nobody ever got hurt, but uh, I put a young lady on the floor in the chair in Seattle, and I felt I was demoralized at that point. I really was. And I've done it a couple of times since then. But uh, it was as simple as and just an honest mistake. And uh, I don't want I'm never out there to hurt anybody. But uh, for the most part, it's all been fun. It's been good times. The knee, sometimes the knee gives out a little bit now. So that's (laughs) not one of the trick shots that I ever do anymore, only because I don't want it to give out at the wrong time. And then if the knee does, I'm going to be two or three boards in some place that I don't want to be. And I think that just comes with age, but uh, it, it is all in fun. And you know what? When I heard you say, I think we're from Eau Claire, uh, you know, right now, that's where you're from. I've been through that area a handful of times, so I know exactly where you're at. <laughs> you know, you actually, I was a, a sports reporter at a, at a TV station in Wausau at the time. You actually led sports that night, and that was a Sunday night where the Packers were playing the Vikings. That's pretty impressive then. <laughs> <laughs> So I got to I got to make sure I get an address and mail you twenty dollars. Uh, <laughs> no, I was just thrilled that uh, you know that you were willing to to talk with us and and you know bowl that match and uh, it, it was cool. Um, I asked Chuck about uh, his favorite moment in your career, and he brought up the uh, the twenty twelve uh, World Championship in Las Vegas. He recalled it was right after Superstorm Sandy. Uh, affected the East Coast, that you barely made the top 24, but each day you kind of moved up the standings and snuck into the show. Uh, He said, we then made a ball change in the 10th frame of match one on the right lane, and that you proceeded to just knock them down one at a time, beating Belmo for the title. Where does something like that rank for you in terms of the titles that you've won over the years? That will go down as the best title that I've ever accomplished. Um, it, knowing the way that everything unfolded, uh, I was entered in a tournament like everybody else, Superstorm Sandy hits, uh, the Jersey shore is devastated. Uh, personally, I live about 20 minutes by the way, crow flies from the shore, but yeah, we had branches down, we had limbs, we had trees all over the place. We had, were three days without power. Uh, but it was way worse. Just 15 minutes east of me for sure. Um, And it didn't look like I was going to get to the tournament. I couldn't go practice. I couldn't do anything. Finally, electric comes on a day before uh, everything's going to start. And when we got electric, you know, we've already had time to go out and clean up our house. And when I say clean up our house, it took me a day and a half to clean up limbs and everything. But when I look across the street, the guy across the street had two big trees through his cars. Uh, You know, it was just we were lucky not to have that. He was unlucky. Wrong place, wrong time. Uh, and I started talking to my wife and she said, uh, Hey, you know, we're all set. We've got, 
heat. We've got everything we need. And if you want to go out and bowl, well, by all means, go out and bowl. So I changed my flight and I got out there and flew out the following day. I had to miss the practice session for the first two squads or the first two events. And uh, I was able to bowl practice session for the last two events and uh, go on from there. Well, I did not make any of the individual cuts in any of the tournaments, but Mm. I did sneak into the top 24 in the world championship. Not knowing the way that things are going to happen. I've been in enough finals before because, you know, this is the traditional format where we've got 24 games of match play. And I know it doesn't matter where you're in that field. You can still figure out a way to get to the top. And I kept, lo and behold, climbing up the ladder, climbing up a little bit more. I sneak into fifth place for the show. Now we've got a day to kill. The storm at home, now things turned around the other way. We just got a foot of snow, and it re knocked all the power out. Jeez. So, I I um oh, I was mortified. So I said to my wife, I said, look, the house is still standing. Everything is fine. Why don't you guys come out? Let's get you on a plane and let's come out here and, and uh, bring the kids out and we'll try to make the best of it. So she did. And uh, it turned out there. Well, here I am bowling for the world championship. And as things would go, uh, my wife is sitting in the front row with my three kids who oh, coincidentally at the time were roughly four, five and six. Okay, they're only 30 months apart, first to last. And they are jumping up and down, hooting and hollering every step of the way. And who would have known that the way that things would unfold, that I was going to be standing tall with a check and trophy of that nature when it was all said and done. And my kids to this day still remember that. Wow. And, you know, like I said, this is Chuck's favorite memory of you. And I'm sure there have been many. I, I mean, how much do you lean on a guy like Chuck when you're in the heat of battle like that? Yeah, you you really look, he's your your eyes and ears behind you. He sees what's going on. You know, you can feel it to some extent, but you're such on top of it there, the front 20 feet, what your ball's doing in the front 20 feet of the lane. The ball's zipping through it before you realize what the ball is doing. And although he's sitting off to the side, like most of the ball reps at that point, they're looking for the way that your ball picks up or doesn't pick up and the way that your ball goes through the pins or doesn't go through the pins. And it was a sincere guess as to what ball to go to or what change to make. And actually, he he was a little bit wrong. Maybe that's showing his age now. He might be <laughs> a little older. But it was at the end of the second match because I pulled uh, Rhino Page. And uh, Rhino only bowled like 160 or 170. And I didn't bowl much more. I might have been about 10 pins higher. And we went for the shot in the dark with changing balls on the right lane. And uh, I bowled my good friend Sean Rash at that point and started out with the front six. So something must have been right in the cards with it. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, tell me about winning the the Cheetah Championship in 2015 in Reno. That was the one that uh, was your 35th, which put you ahead of, uh, you know, Mark Roth, who you've attributed with, you know, with teaching you a lot uh, in terms of PBA Tour titles. And it was your last one to date. So uh, what memories do you take from that one? Well, you you never know when your last title is going to eventually be your last title. You would hope that there's another one to be had somewhere down the road. And and, uh, I still got the fire within me. I'm going to go out and bowl most of the PBA events this year coming up that I'd like to hope that I can rekindle a couple of flames and and make pop one more off before it's all said and done. But uh, it's memorable moments at that point. You know, you're you've got your ball in your hand and, and you're bowling in the title match and at that point, I believe that we were bowling the, the right lane on the left pair and the left lane on the right. So we're, we're kind of flip-flopping back and forth. We're not bowling a standard pair of bowling uh, the way that it would unfold. And uh, I was just thankful to be there, thankful to be in the moment. And like every opportunity, you want to be able to seize that moment and grab and hold on to it. And I believe I was bowling a fellow lefty, a gentleman from England, Paul Moore. Uh, who I'm, I'm good friends with as well. I don't get to see him too much. Uh, actually, with COVID, I mean, nobody's seen anybody within the last two years, very <laughs> rarely. Uh, but uh, he he was trying to win his first PBA title, and fortunately for me that day, I was able to, to stop that. Yeah. Um. So you're going on, like you said, to bowl the you know the PBA tour events. Uh, but this past summer, I mean, you had a lot of success on the PBA 50 tour. 
in 10 days, you won four straight PBA 50 events, two PBA 50 regionals, two PBA 50 tour titles. What was that like to have that measure of success in such a short time? It, uh, unbelievable. I don't, I don't even know where to start with it at that point. You, you know, it just, uh, everything that could happen, all the stars were in a line. Uh, I think the universe, uh, everything lined up perfectly. Uh, it, it was, it was unfathomable. I remember sitting there at the first one, it was a PBA 50 event. Uh, believe it or not, I made the show, the top five show in the PBA national event in Hammond. And I was a little bit lost on one lane. I was bowling Norm Duke. And unfortunately, I lost my match. Norm went on to, to go from there. He bowls Eugene for the title, and, and Eugene ends up winning. Well, then I, I race out of there, and I go bowl a PBA Senior Regional. It's on the way to our next tour stop. I bowl pretty good in the regional. Everything is going good. The next thing I know, uh, I'm bowling uh, another good friend of mine uh, for the title at that point. And... He gets up. We both start off, I think, this, the same spare four-bagger. And then he gets up and he goes, open, open, split, split. And I'm like, oh, wow. Well, you, <laughs> as a player, you're supposed to take advantage of that. Yeah. So I I take and I move on. Fortunately, I win the title. Well, then I miss practice session, the official practice session in Grand Rapids. And I bowl the very tail end uh, when everything was shut off before the re-oil in the lanes for the Pro-Am. So I get out there and I bowl for about 20 or 30 minutes. I have a little bit of an idea, but who knows what's going to happen. So we bowl that tournament. And I'm sitting there and I bowl Tom Hess in the semifinal match on a step ladder. And I bowl pretty good against Tom Hess. And then I'm bowling Bob Learn for the title. And Bob is, I mean, he is rallying the pocket. He is all over it. And unfortunately, he leaves a solid nine on the right lane in the eighth frame on a strike. I've really got no business being in this match at this point. And he gets up on a left lane and he two eight tens. And I go, well, wait a minute. He just drew an open. You know, I mean, I'm looking at it going, hey, you did everything that you could do. You can't really do much more. You gave it your best. I still got a chance to win this now. Well, then I get up and I get on the right lane and I, I, make a seven pin or I didn't went through the nose twice before and split one time on that lane. I said, I can't go high again and give it right back. So I leave a seven pin. I make it. And then I get up and I, I've said this a couple of times. I threw the first strike in the 10th and I got fortunate. If you go back and watch that replay, anybody that's listening, watch a replay. And I came back and I grabbed my ball off the rack and I go, you have to make a better shot. You can't depend on that one strike. And the next two shots, I couldn't make them any better than I did. They were perfect, you know. So I shut Bob out by a pin. Run, run right into the senior regional. And now I'm sitting there and I'm watching it. I sneak into the um, fourth in the step ladder. Bowl the first match. Okay. I, and uh, I think I'm bowling Eugene McCune. And uh, <laughs> Eugene hit the pocket every single time. And you can't hit the pocket any higher flush than he did. Because he went something along the lines of solid 10 pin strike, solid nine strike, solid four pin strike. Uh, let me say ringing 10 strike, blower seven, 10, ringing 10 pin, blower seven. And I'm like, oh my God. And I'm kind of like close, but I've got nothing compared to what he just bought, you know? <laughs> But my score is two teen and two teens enough to beat 199, <laughs> yeah. you know, so it, it's just the way that it worked. And then I, I win the next game and uh, then I'm bowling in the title match once again, or, you know, I bowled Brian LeClaire in a semifinal match and he, and he, uh, he opens in the 10th on a six bagger. I'm like, wow, he's giving this to me too. And Tom Hess is the same way. I bowled Tom Hess. And once again, we're really good friends. He starts off spare four bagger. And then he goes open, open. This is the same exact thing that happened to me against John Marcel. And I go, how is that possible? So I just went to another tournament. Then I bowl the, we go into the last PBA senior national event that I won, the fourth one. Mm -hmm. And uh, I bowl pretty good. I've had success in that center. And I get into the, the championship round as we go. I bowl the first match. 
And uh, I remember bowling 2-0. And I win the match. I believe I bowled Tom Hess again. And I turned around. Now, it, it, you know, Chuck's not there. So I'm turning around to Tom, Tom Carter, who's our ball rep. And I looked right at Tom. I said, I'm bowling Norm Duke. 2-0 ain't winning this game. So I got to figure out something more. Okay. So I try to change balls and do something else. Lo and behold, I did only score 2-0. But little did I know that Norm was going to miss a 10 pin and then miss the 6-10 back-to-back frames. <laughs> and I go, wait a minute here. Norm Duke doesn't miss a spare period, let alone two in a row. And then I end up bowling the title match and I bowl 230 or 40 in the title match uh, against Tom Adcock and Tom never really got lined in. He bowled 150 or 160, unfortunately for him. But I looked at that and I go, are you kidding me? This is like nine or 10 matches in a row here in stepladder finals. And I go, oh, my God, I can't believe this is happening. Yeah. Wow. It's an incredible run and part of an incredible season, really. And it makes sense to me that, you know, that you'd want to kind of keep that going, not only on the the PBA 50 side, uh, but also the you know, the younger guys tour. Tell me about the the future for you in competition. I mean, how long do you think you'll, you know, you'll keep doing the the national tour, the senior tour, whatever else? Well, I'm going to go out and give the regular tour uh, one more go this year. Uh, I'm not saying I'm going to run and bowl every single one of them. Uh, you know, Brunswick has certain things that maybe they want me to do or don't want me to do. Uh, they've allowed me the liberty of going where I want, when I want, how I want. And I can't thank them enough for giving me that opportunity. And they've always stood behind me every step of the way in whatever we decide. But they, I also know, and they know too, that if uh, I get a phone call when we get done right here and, and they say, we need you to go somewhere else tomorrow, then I'm going to get on a plane or I'm going to drive there to get there and take care of whatever we need to, to make it right for all of us in the Brunswick family. So, uh, but I do plan on bowling most of them this year. That would include the the USBC Masters. That would include the Tournament of Champions. So uh, we're going to see where that all unfolds and how it all takes place as things go. If I look back at my season when it's all done, or let me say I'm three or four events into it, and unfortunately Parker Bones in the bottom five, uh, you know, every week, I, I'm going to give, I'll be the first to admit, I'm going to give full full credit to the younger bowlers that are out there, the power, the speed that they possess, uh, you know, at one point I stepped on a table and notched somebody else off. And maybe I created my own mountaintop to climb onto the top two or pyramid, like all of us try to do. And uh, I respect those young guns and what they can do and, and what their ball does going down the lanes, the way that they throw pins around. But at the same token, I still believe Parker bone knows how to bowl. And if Parker goes out and does what Parker has to do, it's not a matter of an age limit. It's a matter of repeatability and being healthy enough and smart enough along the way to get through all the trials and tribulations. Yeah. And these younger guys had to start somewhere. And that place may have been through some of your efforts with junior bowling. Uh, Tell me about what you do for junior bowling and why you do it. Well, I mean, you know, I go to a fair amount of junior events uh, mainly because my kids are entered into them. You know, I, I've got two boys from my first marriage. They're uh, 29 and 32. So they're full grown young men and, and off doing their own thing right now. But the, the three that we have right now, uh, Justin, Brandon and Sydney, although Justin is in Wichita, uh, Brandon is a senior in high school and Sydney is a sophomore in high school. And they bowl a fair amount of local scratch events or local uh, events that are going on junior wise. Sometimes singles, team event. I just coached a, a bunch of teams, uh, a team last weekend in a, a team event out there that my kids bowled in. But they also go to some of the SYCs. I'm actually going to an SYC in Orlando this weekend. I'll be down there with both of my kids because they enjoy those events that they put on there. But the biggest thing that we run every year is we run the Parker Bone Third Junior Scholarship Tournament. And uh, that's an event that we've put our heart and soul and dedicate into and we get a lot of help from the local community with the uh, the local bowlers and their families that actually come out. They want to participate with it. They want to they want to take place in it. Their kids want to bowl in it, obviously. And we turn the event into uh, and turn the bowling center into an event 
for those three to four, sometimes five days. It was a little tricky two years ago. Uh, last year, we had to make it six days because of COVID, because it was limited as to what we could do. And we didn't even know that we would have it, but the bowlers wanted us to have it. So we tried to formulate a field and it all worked out. Knock on wood, everybody was safe and healthy. We tried to formulate an event that everybody could go out there and enjoy and have a good time. And it, they couldn't thank us enough for actually putting it together and trying to mandate the mandates that we did to make it all safe. But it, that's the one time out of the year that Parker Bone does not have the bowling hat on. He's got the tournament director hat on and I put my <laughs> tournament director hat on and, and, and go accordingly. That can be a tough hat to wear, let me tell you. <laughs> Not an easy one. No. We have a, a bunch of comments, and I don't want to miss any of these, so let me let me get to them from the start. Um, Max Grabara is one of our local bowlers here in the Eau Claire area. He says, how do you have the stamina in qualifying, and, and I'm guessing he said match play. I just don't have it. We have a local scratch tourney that allows reentry for the second shift if a bowler wants or needs to. Um, I'm assuming he is talking about the Chippewa Valley match games, uh, which is, uh, I think an eight game qualifier on Saturday, two shifts. You, if you make top 24, you get to Sunday for 12 more and then a step ladder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, depending how many games you have to bowl, that's when you got to keep things under check. I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't want to get up there and miss a shot. And I want to get excited over a shot. If you've got three, four or five in a row. But when you know that you have a long way to go with possibility of a lot of games under your belt in that given day, you got to really ease the moment and, and understand where the energy levels need to go. I know wholeheartedly early on, and, and I'm going to say early on, not 7 or 7.30 in the morning, but early on, meaning the first game or two, you're going to get one or two shots and get excited. And maybe you look up and you go, God, I'm in the top, you know, top three or four of my squad or in the tournament so far. And you're really pumped up, but you got to keep that energy level going along the way and have it keep soaring upward because if it doesn't and you get a pitfall and then you're tired on top of it, the wind comes out of your sails and everything goes backwards. You know, there's been plenty of times that towards the end of a given block, I may only have five or six frames to go. Maybe I've got two or three games. I'll walk inside the bathroom and put some water over my face and my eyes and just freshen myself up. Cause I got to be lively to come out there to finish this block as strong as I did during the block. You can't mm-hmm. afford to let frames slip away from you. Yeah. Well said. Um, let's see. What does he say again? It's amazing how being good at bowling makes a guy popular. I can't get out nine F. <laughs> so much. Um, let, let's move on to his next question. Why is there so much handicap in today's leagues? Uh, it's easier to bowl big games uh, with today's equipment. Thoughts? So it's kind of two different questions there. Handicap system and equipment uh, bringing big scores. Handicap is just part of the way the game. They try to equalize things so that everybody can go out there and play on one level playing field. Every bowling center around the country has good bowlers. Okay. There may be only one or two in your particular center, but there may be 10 or 15 in in another center. But if they want to join a competitive league, and it could be a handicap league, okay? But if they want to join a competitive league that they can have a lot of fun and try to see how well they own up to the guy over here, handicap kind of equalizes that out. What is the fair number? 100% is never the fair number. You know, 80%, 75%, 85%, it's probably somewhere in there ultimately that makes or breaks it. I think 90% is borderline too much, but that's for each individual league or event to figure out and mandate what they want. As far as the bowling balls, yes, the bowling bowling balls have certainly gotten more powerful along the way, but lanes have gotten harder. Oils have gotten thicker, okay? The pins have still maintained the same basic weight integrity behind it. And yes, somebody can say, but yes, look at the scores all over the place. The only thing I'm going to say there is look at NASCAR, how fast they go around a track and they govern it so that they don't go more than 220 miles an hour in in the big, you know, shootouts that they have. Records are made to be broken. Look at what these guys are doing in baseball fields. Look at football fields. Let's talk golf. 
Jack Nicholas and Arnold Palmer, two of the greatest that ever played the sport of golf. They hit it 230 or 240 straight down the center, and that was a King Kong drive. You can't even put their drive in the top 500 on the PGA Tour in today's world and get within 50 yeah. because they can't, they can't compete. But in their perspectives, they would still be in that top three players of the game today if they had the clubs and things available to them that they had back then. Yeah. Um, so Jerry Mars, who uh, came on our show uh, about a month or so ago, he says he remembers one year at the World Series of Bowling. He made the match play portion in two events and that you sat down with him, talked about what to expect and to stay calm. Uh, Reno 2015, you remember? That would have been a little while ago. You're right, but I do remember that. Jerry's a great guy. Hi, Jerry. Hopefully you're enjoying our show here tonight. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, everybody's got to start somewhere. I know the very first time that I made match play out on, on tour, I wasn't sure what to expect. Yeah, I know we're bowling three eight-game blocks of match play, but the nips and tucks, the ups and downs, how it's going to unfold or, or, you know, run around it, I had no idea. So I remember at that point, one of the guys sat down and said, hey, this is what you can look for. These are the little things you see. And uh, one of the, the big players that tried to help me out there, I alluded to earlier, was Johnny Petraglia. He said, it doesn't matter what goes on today. You still got to come tomorrow. But regardless, don't shoot yourself in the foot and take everything that you can get today because you never know what tomorrow is going to bring on the table. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Max says he remembers your bit at the Holler House in Milwaukee. What's that like? <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> I'll tell you what, the Holler House in, in Milwaukee, that's a unique bowling center. Okay, and I'm going to leave it as a two-lane center, you know. Uh, walking back in time, walking into that bar, and then walking down that little set of stairs that they have there, uh, you get halfway down, you make the left-hand turn, and a couple more steps, and you're at two old wooden lanes that with, I believe it was above-ground bar return and pin boys in the back. Yeah. Uh, you know, I got to sign the, the brick wall there or the, the concrete wall, but – if walls could talk, the stories that the, that place could tell could be absolutely amazing. So it's one of a kind atmosphere and enjoyed every single minute of it. And to this day, just like we've just had our conversation now, I still tell people about that place. So if, if Max, if you know anybody that goes there or hasn't been there, tell them to make sure they stop by and see it. Me? I'm, uh, I, I'm ashamed to admit I'm a Milwaukee native and I still have not uh, gone there to at least check it out that's yep. uh yeah, on my to-do list for yeah, sure i actually took my boys there i made them sit in the back and be pin boys for five frames ah. <laughs> i wanted them to experience what original bowling was like back in yesteryear so yeah. that now they understand where it was at least to the best of my ability you know to where things have become throughout the year so it, it, you, you got to go check it out yeah for sure um how much difference is there between ball manufacturers? Now, let me qualify this by saying you've been with Brunswick from the start, right? My entire career. Yeah. Uh, I've won every single one of my tour titles with a Brunswick branded bowling ball. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and I'll say this way outside of Belmo, and I don't know what his title count is, uh, but up until he got to 20 titles, I was the only player with over 20 titles with all under the same hat of one brand. So, but there's differences, there's subtle differences. All the companies make really good bowling balls. Uh, a few of the companies, and I'm going to say us and Storm, have a much bigger variety of bowling balls that gives you choices going down the lanes. Uh, the other companies out there, they may have a good ball or two along the way, but they don't have as many, you know. And I know what we have now with the brands that we've acquired the things that we have out there, the tools that we have available. My God, we have everything from uh, soup to nuts, from just the kitchen sink to the entire kitchen. Uh, you know, <laughs> if you want to throw it straight up the lane, if you want to go around the lane, if you want to loft it and make it strike from sixth arrow, if you want to throw it out of the gutter at 45 feet and make it hook back in, you can do all of that with any one of our Brunswick branded bowling balls. No question. Yeah. 
um, Cedarvale guy who is Brent Prentice, uh, the proprietor at Cedarvale Lanes, Egan, Minnesota, uh, says that you made the wine rhino look amazing and that you can still bowl. <laughs> that was my first title with the wine rhino. I remember that one. Yeah. It's actually sitting right over here to the, to my side uh, <laughs> next to the trophy over here. I had to make sure I kept that one for a while. Yeah. So, but uh, it, it it did work really good then. It it held its place in time. And, uh, y- you know, he says he remembers that wine rhino. So let's just take a little walk right over oh, here for yes. a minute. <laughs> let's uh, see if I can get this thing positioned right. Yeah. Oh, there, there it, is. it is. Yeah. Okay. There it is. And there's the trophy that went along with it. So wow. I remember that wine rhino. It <laughs> it held its weight in gold. And for sure, it's still a part of my life each and every day. That's like a museum that you've got there, really. <laughs> uh, my son, you know, both of my sons did an outstanding job down here. Yeah, they were a little awesome. fragmented in other in our other house. We moved about fifteen or sixteen months ago, and uh, and we've made what's really an unbelievable atmosphere out here now. So it's it's pretty cool. That's awesome. All right. So in in each of these shows, we go off the sheet. And what that means is we ask you to challenge somebody else to be on a future episode against skill level. You know, we kind of throw that out the window. We look for people who are passionate about the sport and have a unique bowling story to tell. So Parker Bone the Third, who would you like to challenge to be on a future episode of Bowling with the Feth? Oh, my goodness. Uh, you know, I, I would <laughs> I'm going to throw Jason Couch in on this one. OK. OK. Jason and me roomed together for over 10 years on tour. Sincerely, we probably would be known as the odd couple. Really, it's an Oscar. There is no doubt in my mind. OK, because he was the wild and sloppy one. And I was always the neat Nick one, you know, with, with having the, the little stickler picking stuff up. But uh, it, he would leave the lights on. He'd be the one closing down one or two bars. I'd be the neat Nick. I'd be the one that's closing the lights out at 10 or 11 o'clock. He would probably tell you that I'm the milk and cookies guy, you know, but uh, it, when I say this, I, I mean it from my heart. He has done one of the things in our sport that I don't know that anybody will ever actually match once again. He won the tournament of champions three consecutive times, but the way that he did it was on three different patterns three different surfaces, three different formats, and still walked away victorious. Wow. And in my opinion, that, you know, the Tournament of Champions is against, it's the best of the best. These are guys that are not afraid to throw three strikes to beach in the 10th. These are guys that are all uh, unwillingly, uncannily, give them the ball in hand. They're going to get the job done. And he succumbed, succumbed all of those challenges. So, I'm going to go out and say Jason Couch is a guy that you should have on this show. All right. Well, Jason, if you're watching either live or on replay and you're interested, if you're up for the challenge, let me know. You can find me on Facebook. Uh, if it's easier for you, email me at bowlingwiththefef at yahoo.com. Uh, our next uh, show is coming up on Monday, uh, November 15th, 6 p.m., uh, and I'm interviewing somebody you might know. I'm uh, wondering if you ever crossed paths with Charlie Tapp. Charlie Tapp, of course I have. <laughs> Charlie Tapp was at my wedding. There you go. <laughs> Give us a, a little taste of what we should know about Charlie Tapp uh, before next week. Oh, my God. The funnies, the laughs, the stories. He's got some good ones. He does. He'll keep you on your toes. You know, <laughs> chuckles a, as a, would be better known as. Uh, I spent some time with, with Charlie when I was out on tour, probably – late 80s, 88, 89, uh, when he was still out there. But uh, he was never one to be down and out. He had a laugh about something and just his charisma. It didn't matter what kind of day you were having. You were going to start laughing about something. So, and that was really, really cool. Yeah. I remember that. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to that. Again, Monday, November 15th, 6 p.m. Central is uh, the next live stream. Parker, it has been an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate your time coming on uh, for your second interview with me. Not many of these guests can say that, but you <laughs> can. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just a pleasure to hear your incredible bowling story and all your accomplishments that you've had along the way. 
Well, Fef, I, I mean, I really do appreciate the time and effort and uh, the fact that you allowed me to be on your show and, and brought me on board. But you did say something here that started uh, in the beginning of the night. And, and I'm going to tell you this because I feel very honored and have been a part of this for a number of years. Through my career, I've probably been on at least 50, if not 100 different military installations around the world. Oh. Okay, I've been in Korea. Uh, I've been in, in bases over in Germany. Uh, I've been in an endless amount of them here in uh, the United States. I've been on probably 10 or 15 different bases over in Japan through the years. But I would agree with you sincerely. Happy Veterans Day to all of our veterans out there. They allow us to live the life that we live. And, you know, although I've never had that opportunity to serve our country, when I go out there and I step into their bowling atmosphere or step onto their base, uh, my heart goes out for each and every one of them because they sincerely are the true heroes that we have around the world that, that are our watchdog to allow us to live this life of freedom. So uh, uh, happy Veterans Day to not just yourself, but anybody else that's listening out there. So uh, thanks to Brunswick because Brunswick has always been a part of me. Um, they gave me that opportunity a long, long time ago. And I am, oh my God, from my heart, I am so glad that I've been with what I feel is the best company to be with in the world. So uh, thanks to them. Thanks to you, Fef. Uh, you know, you made this all possible. I know Chuck threw my name out there. At least, uh, you know, that's what we're going with. So, uh, uh, you know, sincerely, we'll go that way there. But uh, I do appreciate it. You run an awesome show here. I've enjoyed every moment of it. And the last but, but not least, thanks to all your fans, all those bowling fans that are out there listening. You know, they tune in. They're listening to not just your show here, but they're out on their lanes there. They're trying to figure out how to make their ball work a little bit more to throw one more strike or, or fill one more frame. But please, I can't wish them all the best enough, but tell them to please continue that up. Hopefully their scores will be high along the way. And until I get an opportunity to see each and every one of them again, may you have a great holiday season coming up. What a great way to end it. Thanks again. Thanks to you. And uh, again, everybody, be just and fear not. We will see you next week.